We now finally come to the second method to handle multiple parameters called all pairs testing. Most functions or test cases, if you will, have more than four parameters. Actually, that is, of course, true for anything that is non-trivial. And this is, of course, then the case where combinatorics hurts especially. The all pairs method supports this case very well. And we're going to look at this in detail now. I think the best way to explain it is to look at a simple example, which is, of course, a fake, but it shows the, the core of the idea. Let's assume you have a little dialog box shown here on the left where you enter some input value, and there are some options of what you want to do with it. So you have a radio button with a radio group with three selections, some check boxes, some combo boxes with some choices, and then the big do it button that does something with the value and whatever else. So if you think about how to test this thing, or the behavior of what is behind, you see, of course, all the parameters. We've talked about parameters all along. So the input value is what is computed. The options is what we really need to model. So we have a radio button, a radio group with three values, four checkboxes with binary values, so zero and one they can be. Then we have a four-choice combo box and a three-choice combo box. And this gives you a total that you see down here of 576 test cases, just the product of the choices. Of course, this is already way beyond normal test investment that you can afford. And so basically already here for this little example, exhaustive testing is impossible. Now, what does all pairs do? You define a model. What I just said is about the radio group. You have a, a, a control with three options, then multiple checkboxes and so forth. The parameters that you have there, you write them down in a so-called model file. What you see here is the uh, model file of a picked tool, we'll come to that in a minute. And so this is very simple. You just try variable name, colon, and then the variables, the values separated by commas that are possible. You just write it down like this. Then you run a tool, the all pairs generation tool. Here um, we use picked. And then you get it as an output, a list of test cases that the tool generated. And here we see that 14 test cases generate the all is generated by the all pairs tool. Now you may wonder why is it possible to get do almost the same thing with 14 test cases that you would do with 576. And this is what we'll think about now. Because there is a serious empirical foundation for this method to work, the point is that most faults, and that is really between 70 and 90 percent, can be exposed or they occur by combining two parameters just right. What does this mean? Well, consider, for instance, if you have a simple function that has three arguments and uh, p1, p2, p3, and they can th take three values, one, two, three, or so, then most faults will show up when, for instance, two values, say p2 and p3, have a certain value combination. So two, p2 is p2 and p3 is 3. In that case, the, the method blows up, for instance. And <clears throat> we'll look at that exactly what that means. But basically, this is like an empirical truth of software, and it's also shown on the right-hand side here in the graph. What you see here is a statistic of an analysis of um, many software classes, medical devices, browsers, servers, NASA software, and they analyzed how many parameters are needed to expose a defect. So how many, what really, how many parameters does a defect or the behavior really depend on? And you see here, one parameter for let's look at the set NASA line here 70 percent two parameters 90 say 93 or so what this means is that if you test systematically all parameter combinations you should catch 93 percent of the bugs and this is really the essence of the uh, method because all pairs testing now it generates minimal test cases test case variants that cover all parameter combinations and this is why it's called all pairs, because you only focus about pairs. And it is a proven industry practice, as you can also see from the analysis here. There's been a lot of research going on of why this works and when and how, how well it works. <clears throat> now, what does it mean to combine all pairs? Let's think again about um, a case, three variables with now two values each, to so make it really simple. The essence is this. You consider first the pairs of variables because you only want to make sure that all pairs show up once. So P1, P2, P3, I'm sorry, P1, P2, P2, P3, and P1, P3. Those are the three pairs of variables. We have to have to ensure 
that all value pairs for each of them, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, occur only or at least once in the test. And so the tool now, what it does, it, it merges value pairs into minimal test case set and to generate to cover all pairs. What does this mean by example? Well, look at the case A. If you see there, we have two test cases, all zeros, all ones. All values appear only once. This, of course, is not effective enough. Yeah, you can do also full combinatorics, that is case B here, where you see three variables and all value combinations are done, so you get 2 to the power of 3 is 8 cases. And this is not efficient, you cannot afford this, especially if you get more variables, like in the case before 576. All value pairs means this, that you can take any value per, uh, and pair of parameters, like say P2, P3, and say what is two, P2, P3? 1, 1, where is this in the test? And you see, aha, uh -huh, it is case 2. And P1, P3, 1, 0, where is this? Okay, it's down here. So any combination of variables and their values you will find in this test matrix. And this, of course, is guaranteed by the tool. The beauty is that <clears throat> the savings that you get from, from the uh, full combinatorics case is also exponential it, so the, the number of test cases needed grows very flat for instance 500 binary parameters can be covered with all pairs testing with only 20 test cases and 1500 binary parameters for instance can be covered with 24 test cases so it's extremely flat with the number of parameters We'll now look at a, an example to show this a little more in detail by a, by a more real example and so, so how you show you how to do the real all pairs modeling and how you would go about this. And we do this by example of a um, in an SAP application called EPOS. This is point of sale for uh, retail store, st stores. And uh, the mix and match feature is the feature that where you can advertise specials like you buy two get one free or if you buy three of these you get 30 percent off or whatever so this of course is all to go to, to go into the database and then when the customer comes and buys those three things they have to get the discount so this is what we're going to look at and the approach is this that we first identify the parameters and their values and we apply equivalence classing boundary values on the fly then we enter those parameter definitions into the model file the, the little model file that you look, saw before into the pick tool and then the tool generates pair coverage test case using the all pairs testing workbench which is also available for download so as we discussed before we now focus on positive functional correctness only all the error handling and single parameter errors has uh, been dealt with now what you would do <coughs> if you look at this test scope of this one feature mix and match definition you go basically field by field and think about what's supposed to happen with it and let's start at the top. So first we look at here, we have a mix and match ID. This is the ID probably of the, of the whole um, special definition. And so we, it just has to be unique. We don't care about it. Then we have descriptions, two of them. Description and discount description, those are just text fields. They are also irrelevant for the text. Then we have to the right here, the dates when it starts and when it ends. And also here, we don't care because it is just the duration of how when the um, the special applies and you surely want to test that you hit the boundary just right maybe you want to do a boundary value test on the second to make sure that really the special is applied at the right moment in time but for now we want to focus on the functionality of the special definition of the advertisement definition and so forth so the date really doesn't matter for us either that's why those five actually seven fields don't go into the test modeling right now we come to the first group of fields here criteria and you've seen this before we have a radio group here with three values and we have three binary parameters check boxes that can be modeled with zero one or yes no or whatever and we put them into a model file like this so you see now I have this syntax again, variable name, colon, and then comma separated list of possible values. This is how you enter it into the tool. 
So now let's look at the tool here. You see the all powers testing workbench. Right now you see here the little demo model that we looked at before, just uh, to show, introduce the, the, the core idea. I already prepared a file. We have here the EPOS beginning model, and I'm going to delete this to keep up the uh, tension a little bit. But what you saw before here, those three, four variables, this is what we have so far from the modeling. This is what I put into the model. If I press generate now, it will generate a test case, test plan, if you will, for those four variables. And you see here the four variables and the values that the tool combines. So this is now seven test cases for those four parameters. Now let's go back to the PowerPoint. We look now at the next fields that belong to the test. So now we come to the next group of fields that you can see here. They're titled pricing rules. And we're going to go again field by field just to give you an idea of how to handle something like this, how you go through. If you start at the top here, and I'll just really say you need to know something about appli the application, but you can actually go very far without knowing too much detail. So all I'm saying here is just really general knowledge, if you will, uh, of test design and, 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 and what is supposed to happen. So <clears throat> you see here, first of all, a radio group with two items, a field, and then a combo box. What the semantics is, if you click on item key, you can specify an item, or if you click on an eligibility rule, you can select a set of items. This, of course, is necessary because if you have things like all cosmetics are 10% off next week, then you don't want to enter you know, 20,000 articles in a big store, but you will just say cosmetics is a group of products that every product either belongs to or not, and then you can apply specials to those groups as well. So for the point, the point of those four fields is really to select the item for which the, pes, uh, the special applies. And so you, if you click here, you have to enter an item key, like the ID of, say, a cereal box or whatever. And then if you click on eligibility rule, on the other hand, you have to select a set of items. And so those four UI fields turn into one parameter because either if you click here you select an existing item key it has to exist and if you click here you select one of those fields so in essence you either specify an existing item key item key existing or you select one of those elements here and you see that what's in the combo box I put down here so basically those four fields turn into one variable in the model eligibility rule and this defines what um, what object or what item the uh, special applies to. The next thing is operation. So we go top to bottom, left to right. So the next thing you see here is operation. There we can see greater, greater, equal, equal, less, equal, less. Now you see here a vertical bar and a comma. So the comma we already know. The vertical bar is something new. It's called OR. It's like an OR operator. And basically what this is remember that we talked about equivalence classes before that these values here in the between the commas those those are actually equivalence classes and you can specify multiple representatives of an equivalence class here what does this mean well every time it wants to take a value of this um, this value here it will alternate those two and what this in essence means semantically is that you say well greater and greater equal is so similar in its behavior that I don't need to pair all values with all other values but I'll treat them the same for the purpose of all pairs and just alternate and we'll come to that more in a minute so this is here the operator and we're done with that now quantity is another interesting case here's a fixed value two, and you may wonder why that is because it is it, it, it of course this will not generate any new combinations it will just always put the value two at this place well, what this means is what you're testing here is that basically the computer, uh, the system can count. So if somebody buys two items of a thing that uh, there is a special defined, it doesn't matter in what order, if they come together or whatever, that you test that 
they are recognized regardless of order. For instance, also if the item that you, for instance, get 30% off of comes before the items that are the conditions, all these things, um, this has to be tested. And by saying two, you just basically say, if the computer counts two, I believe they can count anything. And this is, of course, the typical thing uh, in computer science where they say, you know, if you, if you, one, Two and infinity is the only thing that matters in in volume because if the computer can count two, they can kind of count any anywhere. Then basically you go to the right, go move on like we did before, and this is I'm not going to go into more detail, but you see again, there's a radio group, three values. You just put them in. You don't even think about it, and so forth. You go all the way down here, and <clears throat> now we will put this text again in the model. So let's say we did this by modeling. We, we did this actually on the fly. We typed it into the model. We get this now. We put all the input here. And then we press generate again. And now we get the full test plan with 11 variables and 22 test cases. So those 11 variables and 22 test cases is the full generated all pairs test plan for this case. There are more features to this tool, as you can guess, maybe from some more tabs here, but we won't go into this now. Uh, you get the tool and also the videos about it at the All Pairs Wiki. So now let's go back to the presentation and finish this topic. This is the second part, and actually this, so we won't go any further. You see how we go through field by field and decide how to put a field into the module, maybe not at all, a model, um, or and how to model this parameter for this test case and what's relevant. So what is the variability? And that's what you put into this model file and then the tool generates the uh, appropriate all pairs test plan that covers, ensures that all pairs are covered. You saw the vertical bar. I want to talk about that a little more because when values behave very similar with respect to the test, you can represent them as multiple representatives of one equivalence class. So for instance, if you do a comparison greater and greater or equal, it's almost the same. If it is done, if the computer does it once right, it's a boundary value that should be tested if you hit the right value as a boundary, but it doesn't have to be paired with all other variables. So to do this, the pick tool allows you to define so-called alias groups using the OR operator. And you can see this down here in the box. It's really basically how all the techniques that we had, equivalence classing, boundary values, and all pairs come together here in this tool. So you have the parameter definition, and then say the first value one is actually, of course, an equivalence class because you can take multiple representatives. And you specify the lower bound, some middle representative if you want, and an upper bound. The same for value two is an equivalence class. It's actually a range many times, and you specify the lower bound and the upper bound and some inside representative that you may be interested in. So by doing it this way, you're basically saying, for this equivalence class, use LB or rep or UB. And this means every time the tool needs a value here, it will pick one of these in turn and will basically go around robbing around. Um, this is a very nice way to integrate everything, and this is how all pairs testing, with, especially with the PIC tool, combines the whole, all methods into one integrated whole. Note that empty should remain a separate value if it's legal for a parameter. Many input values can be this empty in real applications, so they, are, they have some kind of default behavior. Now, either you verify once that the right default behavior is taken and then use that value uh, from that, then on, or you just define also a new value. So you may be saying comma empty here to create a case where empty is taken as a real input value, and then you want to test if the program behaves correctly. There can be cases where you don't see any input variables. And this is the case when you basically have hidden parameters or attributes an object state that actually are the real parameters. For instance, if you look at this, this um, case down here where you have some objects, like a, it looks like a file system, you have objects here that you select and then you select an operation on this object, whatever this means. Each of those operations itself has at most one parameter. So you may wonder, well, where is all the, is there any 
common networks? Is there any attributes that affect the code? And yes, there are in this case and also in many cases, but they're hidden in the sense that the object that you selected carries the parameters and not the input. And so in this case, for instance, this elements here, they all have four attributes, doc status, user type, lock state, and doc bar code. And so for the test planning, for the test modeling, if you will, you do not look only at the input variables, but also at the object attributes. And remember, this is going back to the one slide at the beginning where we said there are three sources of input. There is the direct input, there is configuration, and there's object state. This is the object state. Configuration is a similar item where you may have a switch that says the software behaves this or that way, and this also affects the test, so you have to consider that as well. But if you do not see any direct input parameters, most likely the parameters are on the object that you are selecting for an operation. Finally, we should talk about constraints because in many cases, certain value combinations are illegal in a program. So for instance, we could have a case where if A equals 1, then B cannot be 1. And this is the rule that uh, the uh, software, the program, enforces. By, by whatever semantics. Now, of course, because we generate all pairs by the method, we will get at least one test case variant with A equals 1 and B equals 1 because this is what the tool guarantees. And it, of course, means we cannot execute this test. Now, maybe you get a good error message, but the trouble is if you just ignore this test case, you will lose all pair combinations that are embedded in the test case. So in a typical case, if you have some real constraints, it can happen that maybe even half of the generated test cases that are naively generated without constraints are illegal, and then you will lose half of your pair coverage. So the consequences to make a decent test plan is that you have to prevent illegal parameter value combinations by specifying constraints. And you do this, if you look at the box here on the right-hand side, very simple. This is part of the pick tool syntax. You can say, for instance, if P equals P1 equals C, then P2 must be Y. Or you can say P2 equals X, then P1 is A and cannot be A, and P3 cannot be C. So you can have multiple ones here. You can say equals and not equal. Or you can have like a universal rule, which always applies. And it says that for all things that are generated, P1 must not be the same as P3. So this is how you can specify constraints on the generated test plan. And these will be honored by the tool, basically, that it will check for all things it wants to generate if any of those constraints are violated and otherwise discard to put the pair in that it wanted. So this is a very good feature and actually a very important feature for practical use. The details on how to do this in the exact syntax are very well described in the picked language documentation that you get with the tool. Finally, where is all pairs applicable? Well, first of all, you have to have at least four parameters to make it worth it. Um, and these parameters have to be semi-coupled, so it means that there is some interaction possible. If you have an, just an UI where you have the customer address, phone number, and a street name and city or something, those fields do not interact, and there is no if in the code that depends on it. It's just going to the database and back. So that is not a good example. But some fields where some logic is behind, and you know this from the application. And this is actually very often the case that you have those. And the applicable op test object types are actually quite a lot. You, if you look for them, you see it almost everywhere. What we looked at in the example was UI level, so we can see the fields on the screens. Uh, the same way you can look at functions and where you have APIs, so to speak, so you have the parameters and their values directly in the call. Then you can think about a scenario test where objects flow between systems and they have variations and they're also logical parameters, if you will, with many steps. And so the whole scenario test becomes one um, test model. Then component and version combinatorics, so things like operating system, database, browser, and so forth, the combinations of those versions and how to test them. And finally, configuration. So the easiest configuration is maybe an on-off switch like we have for enhancement packages. Um, but there can be more complex ones. And also this interaction with from behavior from the configuration with the code can be modeled that way. So it's very broad, and you can um, handle many different cases with this. 
How to get started in practice is you should go to the All Pairs Wiki where you find the tools, real life examples from SAP projects, um, tips and tricks, modeling examples, and so forth. And <clears throat> um, yeah, a good way to get started. There's also additional training videos with more in depth treatment of the method and also how to use this tool here. Finally, now we come to the summary of the whole video series. Basically, we talked about equivalence classing boundary values that we apply on single parameters and decision tables in all pairs on the multi-parameter side. Focus is on functional correctness and, of course, implicitly error handling. In this table, you see, again, the key idea behind the method. What does, how does the method work and when does it apply? And below, you see some links. The most important one, I guess, would be the test design community that uh, this video course would also will be posted on but also a link to the sub-certified QE course. This is where you, if you participate in that, you have a five-hour test design uh, module with lots of exercises and a lot more depth. And then, of course, the All Pairs Wiki, which is specifically devoted to All Pairs testing. You find all the examples and tools and so forth. So this is the end of the introduction videos to the test design. I hope this is useful for you. And again, if you need more information, then go to those links and we are also very happy about feedback you can give via the page and the community space. Thank you.